139 from the SportstownChicago.com studio. I'm Paul Shabari, and if you listen to this show regularly, you know what this music means. I've got my guy Gabe Salgado on. Normally we talk about college hoops, and we might touch upon that today. But uh, today, actually, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the plight of indoor football, arena football in Chicago. Uh, Gabe, Gabe just wrote an article for Chicago Now talking about the future of the Chicago Rush, the Arena Football League team. And uh, we, we're also going to touch upon the Chicago Slaughter, who played in the, the Indoor Football League last year and were slated to play in the Continental Indoor Football League this year until they announced that they uh, folded their season. Uh, Gabe, welcome welcome back to the show. I look forward to this uh, this conversation here. Hey, Paul. How's it going? It's going all right. Um, now, th- this is going to be uh, kind of perfect here because you got a chance to cover the Chicago Rush the last couple seasons, and I covered the Chicago Slaughter last season. And surprisingly, at least in the slaughter sense, surprisingly, they're not going to have a season this year. But um, I, th- I think with the rush, we all kind of saw, based on the business problems that they faced last season, uh, that that this season might not happen with them. But uh, did did you expect that that there wouldn't be a 2014 season with the Chicago Rush? Uh, you know, um, it was looking very possible when they. Uh, were forced to move out of the Allstate Arena and had to play the rest of their home games in Rockford and uh, spent the end of the season on the road. It kind of felt like the writing was on the wall there. Uh, you know, the, the the main issue being, aside from the fact that they uh, can't find a cop and an owner for the team, the league decided they no longer wanted to fund the team because it was becoming too big of an expense. So it kind of, I mean, I didn't want it to happen, but at the same time you kind of knew it was ha- happening because there were just too many uh, negatives going on there. Now you went you went and covered the team last year. How do they draw for uh, the Chicago Rush? How do they draw at the Allstate Arena? I mean, was it was it a popular team? Because I, personally, I've never been to a Chicago Rush game, um, but but I mean, it's such a large market that we have here in Chicago that uh, you would think a lot of uh, professional and uh, uh, professional teams, or at least the top tier of their leagues, would would be able to succeed in, in a in a market like this. But uh, how did how did the Rush draw last year? Last year, they didn't draw very well at all. Um, uh, they started off at the season. Uh, they started. They drew okay, but not uh, as much as uh, they, they would have hoped. But then as the problems with uh, the, the business end and the financial end and, of course, the aspect of having no Jumbotron and uh, no Internet for the media there, um, as that started to drag on, attendance just started getting worse and worse. And then, like I said, they moved up to Rockford where attendance got slightly better. But the Metro Center only holds about 5,000 people, so it didn't take much to get a crowd there. You know, you had a, you know, a lot of people that were from Rockford were curious because they hadn't had an indoor football team since the Rock River Raptors had folded. So it was nice for them to get a, you know, get a look at a team. But, you know, ultimately they just had trouble drawing and, um, just, you know, a lot of variables that went into that. And you were saying that uh, because they had a smaller uh, stadium out in Rockford, it, it, it drew well, or at least it would look full. But uh, do you think that Rockford is the type of uh, city that could support an arena football team regularly, or do you think that was just kind of the the luck of, of having to end up with uh, Allstate Arena kicking out the, the rush? Well, you know, they, they had the Rock River Raptors for years. Uh, they played, I want to say it was either the uh, UIFL or the IFL. It was one of those two. And, you know, they were, uh, I want to say about a good five, six years they had that team. So they supported it for a little while. Um, I don't think that they would be able to support a team as big as the Rush. I mean, I know they tried for a few weeks, but, um, you know, Rockford, um, although, you know, uh, Rockford did have, you know, they do a pretty good job of supporting the Ice Hogs, but that's because the Ice Hogs have the money there and the plus the backing of the Blackhawks, too. So, I mean, um, really it would all depend on, you know, what type of money was involved and, you know, who the, who the ownership was. But, um, you know, like I said, they had the Rock River Raptors for a number of years and it was successful for a little while. Now, could you kind of touch upon what the problem was with the ownership last year with the Rush? I know... Uh, it, it, the vaguely from kind of kind of recalling the story last year as you were covering it, the the owner was kind of a failed businessman or who didn't have the the proper uh, credit or credentials to even back a team like this, and that kind of caught up with him. Uh, could you could you kind of elaborate on that for me? Well, you know, uh, David Starl, he uh, literally purchased the team at the eleventh hour in February of twenty thirteen. Uh, the previous ownership who had bought the team from the league at the end of 2012, 
Uh, they, uh, I guess, from what I've been able to understand, is that uh, they had the money to purchase the team, but I guess they had difficulty funding the day to day of it. So David Starr came in, he bought the team. You know, he he talked a good game. He definitely had a plan in mind, but then all these things started coming out about you know past convictions and uh, failed business dealings, and ultimately, he, ultimately, I guess he didn't have. Uh, the money to keep a team going. Uh, from what I've heard from sources that I had at that time is that uh, the check that he wrote to Allstate Arena to pay for rent for the arena had bounced. So, uh, I mean, and, uh, the um, not having a jumbotron and not having video and not having internet in the press box, that apparently was also part of it where they just they just didn't pay the bill for it, I guess. And, um, and you got to remember, um, the, the Chicago Rush was was created by Walter Payton. And uh, he left the team to his business partners when he passed away, and they put the team up for sale after the AFL suspended the 2009 season. So from 2010 through 2012, the league had owned and, had owned and funded the team. And then, like I said, they, they wanted to sell the team at the end of the season. First they sold it to another owner, then they sold it to, then it was sold to David Starl, and then the league took the team back after Starl uh, failed to meet his obligations. Now, if I recall, uh, the Rush also had, uh, they were touting Mike Ditka as like a minority owner, just a, I think kind of a figurehead that they wanted to parade around. It seemed like that the team had more success um, drawing well and uh, success on the field, because I believe they won Arena Bowl 20, while Ditko was still kind of that figurehead uh, sort of owner. Uh, it kind of parallels with the slaughter in the sense that, you know, former Bear Steve McMichael is a minority owner uh, and the coach of the team, and then Jim McMahon was also kind of a silent partner in the whole thing. He never really made appearances or anything. But uh, do, do you think that that's something that, uh, whatever the future of of whatever the next team is in Chicago and uh, playing indoor football, do you think that that's something that they should really try to consider? Is is bringing back kind of that hype behind the eighty five Bears to try and draw people? You know, it, it would help, but again, at the end of the day, it all boils down to you know, do you have the capital and do you have the finances to ultimately run the team on a day to day basis? I mean, even if you do have a big name behind it, if there's no money behind that big name. You know, I, I think I think you're doomed to fail. But uh, um, having Mike Ditka as a minority owner was really a great thing for the Rush. You know, it brought a it brought more recognition to the team. But you know, more or less, that was all about just having oversight over the football aspect of everything. Uh, Walter Payton's business partners they had the business side uh, down pack, but they weren't really football knowledgeable. So what they did was they sold uh, a portion of the ownership to Mike Ditka, so that way they could have somebody oversee the football operations for the team. Um. Now, I guess with this season, I don't know how realistic it was that the Rush were going to be able to find an owner. They weren't going to be able to play at Allstate Arena, or at least not be able to afford them. But I'd imagine that, you know, up until a couple of days ago, we thought that there was going to be a team playing out of the Sears Center, uh, maybe not for the AFL, but for a different league. The Slaughter were one of nine teams in the IFL. And uh, didn't they weren't they were unable to pay some of their players by the end of the season? It was kind of a kind of odd how they ran that organization, and it, it looked like they were going to be back this season. They they bought a new uh, domain for their website. They were making announcements that they were bringing back players like Juice Williams, Cody Kirby, uh, Daniel Dufresne, and uh, and and then all of a sudden the other day the Daily Herald comes out with an article saying that the slaughter canceling their 2014 season. Now, I don't know if you'd heard as well, too, there was a, a on Facebook, uh, what had popped up was an official page for the Chicago Blitz, and there was never any real information about who exactly the Chicago Blitz were, but the rumor was that the slaughter were going to change over to the Chicago Blitz, which coincidentally was the name of the USFL team that played uh, at Soldier Field in the 80s. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the slaughter kind of were keeping the rush from being able to use the Sears Center as an arena for this season, or if that was even going to be a possibility to have an AFL team play play in the city of Chicago. Well, uh, you know, in all honesty, um, I'm not too sure what went on as far as why the slaughter canceled their season. Um, you know, I, I found out an announcement that I saw in a Facebook group uh, that focuses on uh, indoor football teams across the country, and that's where I got that information from. 
And um, uh, I did not read the Daily Herald article that you were talking about, but um, it's you know as far as like you know trying to keep the AFL out of Chicago, I can't really say if that was the case for sure. And as far as the Chicago Blitz goes, uh, you talk about the team from the '80s. The logo looks a lot similar to the team from the '80s, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, what the deal with that is, but they play in the CIFL, uh, the league where the Slaughter won its only championship. I'm not too sure about the particulars of what's going on with the Slaughter and, and uh, the Blitz and how they factor into everything, uh, but the Blitz, I can tell you this, it doesn't sound like they're going to play at the Sears Center because with the Sears Center, the reason why that they're pushing for a comeback for the rush is because they need is because they need tenants, and, you know, they need a full-time tenant, and, you know, uh, they're barely scraping by with what, you know, the concerts and, you know, other random events that they have through the course of the year, but ultimately they're going to need a sports team uh, to, to, fill that, uh, to fill that venue and occupy a good chunk of the, uh, the, arena, the arena date. So, um, uh, you know, as far as, like, the slaughter and the blitz, I really can't, comment a whole lot on that because I'm not too familiar with the particulars of what's what's happening with either team. But uh, the rush rush going to the Sears Center makes sense. You know, uh, it'll probably be easier to fill the seats there because, you know, it's a, it's a smaller arena with uh, less seating capacity. Uh, but ultimately the question is, you know, can they find, you know, a competent owner who has the money, who has the means, who has the reputation, and who has, you know, uh, somewhat of a clean record that they haven't been in trouble for anything. Uh, the other issue you got to take into consideration as well as, you know, hiring a coach that's willing to take upon the task of reviving a franchise. And then you got to put a team together and then you got to find a way to find ways to bring revenue in. And then the question is, can you get the fans to come out and can you get the media to come out? So it's as much as the Sears Center would like to have the rush back, it's a lot easier said than done. And it's a much bigger challenge than people realize. Do you think the Sears Center, though, uh, would be a better venue than the All-State Arena in, in, in terms of a just more realistic way to, to hold a team like this, or do you think the location of it kind of limits them? Well, you know, the location can be an issue because of how far the Sears Center is away from the city, and plus, you know, having to pay, having to pay the tollway to get there could probably be, you know, a Florida people's side, especially when you factor in the price of gas and everything else but you know as far as um you know profitability it could work because like i said it's a smaller venue you know they could they could easily get like four or five thousand fans a game and you know still you know make some money off of it because they don't have to worry about you know trying to fill a near twenty thousand seat arena so in, in the long term it could be easier for them but like i said it's a matter of actually getting the fans to come out considering, you know, how far it is from the city and, you know, get, you know, the price of gas and then having to pay the toll as well. Uh, One final question about, uh, you know, before we move on maybe to a little bit of basketball, but uh, how has the AFL uh, bounced back since the 2009 uh, canceled season? Um, Because I feel like, uh, you know, you probably know this too because we're about the same age. Growing up in the 90s, uh, AFL was a little bit more, uh, popular. It, it was just uh, kind of out there up front to the public. ESPN would play a lot of games. Uh, there was even that video game, the Kurt Warner AFL football. Um, has has the AFL really had a resurgence since since that canceled season, or is it is it a league that's still kind of financially struggling? It's definitely a league that's still financially struggling because player salaries have dropped significantly. You know, since they had those big TV contracts and uh, since they suspended the season. And, um, you know, not only, not only as far as, uh, you know, pay cuts for players and coaches as well, but also, you know, how many teams have, uh, have come and gone and how many teams have, like, switched venues and moved from one city to the next. So, I mean, the AFL, they're hanging in there, but they are not the powerhouse that they once were. All right, now I want to transition to a little bit of hoops before I let you go. Um, you said you were going to be covering the Northwestern practice today, and uh, lately that seems to be one of the few positive stories coming out of this state even, uh, you know, let alone locally, uh, you know, putting together a couple of uh, key wins against uh, Indiana and Purdue there. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what you're seeing with Northwestern right now and uh, why things are kind of working out or why they're able to be such a surprise team right now in the middle of, uh, of a, a hot uh, Big Ten season. Well, the first thing is their defense. Uh, when I went to Northwestern's media day back in October, you know, Drew Crawford and head coach Chris Collins had said that they were putting a, a new emphasis on defense as opposed to Bill Carmody, who was only focused on offense. So, 
you know, they, uh, they've gotten better defensively. They've gotten better as a rebounding team. Um, they've gotten better at guarding the perimeter. They've really done a solid job of limiting team shots. And then the other reason is uh, Trey Demps has recently emerged as a third scorer for Northwestern. You and I have talked about in the past how Northwestern relies too much on Drew Crawford and Jershon Cobb, and they really don't have that third scoring threat. Well, they're, they're getting that in Trey Demps. You know, they're getting that in Trey Demps. And also it'll be interesting to see if Dave Sobolewski practices today. He's been out the last week or so with the concussion. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what his status is and if he'll, he'll practice today. I know he did shoot around with the team recently, but he hasn't been able to fully participate as he's still uh, going through the motions of trying to come back from the concussion and meet the protocol to, to return and everything on that. And then, you know, just to see this, you know, the Northwestern finally come together as a team. You know, they're, they're 500 right now. They're 10 and 10. Uh, they won before their last five, I want to say it is, and uh, they really, they've really gotten better. And uh, they're going to have a big test this weekend when Iowa comes to Walsh Ryan Arena, and we know what happened the last time Northwestern played Iowa. It wasn't pretty, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how Northwestern has improved and, you know, how how well they can perform against Iowa considering how good of a shooting team Iowa is. So hopefully we'll we'll find all that out today. And uh, I got one more question while we're on the subject of uh, college hoops. I don't know if you heard about uh, uh, Warren Buffett, the the billionaire uh, mogul, uh, said that uh, he will pay a billion dollars to whoever fills out a perfect bracket this year. Have you heard anything about that? You know, I did hear about that briefly. I, I didn't really catch the whole story, but uh, uh, although that's a nice charitable gesture by Mr. Buffett, let's be honest. I mean, we all know it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the odds of getting a perfect bracket are slim to none. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if that happens. I doubt it, but it's a nice gesture by Warren Buffett to, uh, you know, you know, give away some of his money and perhaps use it as a tax write-off as well. <laughs> the uh, the odds of getting the perfect bracket are one in nine quintillion, and uh, no one has ever achieved such a feat, according to uh, ESPN Fantasy. And uh, I don't know, I don't know about you. Uh, I'm going to be filling out a bracket this year. Uh, however, it's going to be done with uh, with Warren Buffett's perfect bracket challenge. Uh, cause that that just sounds uh, too good to be true to to win a billion dollars just by picking sports teams. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, just like you said, the odds are against you, so I don't know if there's anybody who will actually do that. So, you know, the chances of anybody getting that money are, are slim to none, to be honest with you. But, you know, like I said, again, it's a nice gesture, but, you know, I mean, it's also impossible as well. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, uh, Gabe, anything else you want to you wanna add in here? Well, you know, the Bears have hired uh, Paul Pasqualoni to be their defensive line coach uh, uh, former Syracuse head coach. Uh, he was there during the Donovan McNabb years. Uh, he's worked as an assistant in the NFL, recently coached at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he brings a lot of experience and expertise. Uh, they also signed a, a new linebackers coach. I can't remember his name for the moment, but uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, the Bears uh, are uh, really trying to rebuild that defense, and obviously it's starting by you know with the coaching staff, and now it's only a matter of time before they start shuffling players around to try to make that adjustment and improve the defense for 2014. Yeah, it's it's a step in the right direction. Uh, Reggie Herring is is the linebackers mm-hmm. coach. There we go. Okay. But yeah, you know, obviously the Bears they did their due diligence in finding uh, replacements, and you know the Bears definitely, you know, they definitely got some guys who know what they're doing. Let's just hope they can translate that into success on the field. Will you be? Uh, I know it's a little early, but will you be covering uh, the OTAs or uh, any practices down in Bourbon A this summer? I hope so. We'll see how that works out. Right now, it's, uh, it's still only January, so I still have some time before I get that all situated. But I would love to do that again. All right. Well, uh, thank you once again, Gabe. Uh, I look forward. Uh, maybe next week we can talk a little bit about the Super Bowl as well as some more college hoops. All right. Take care, Paul. All right. That was Gabe Salgado. He's a freelance writer. You can follow him at Gabe Salgado eighty two on Twitter. Um, always gives me great stuff. Uh, I can talk to him about just about anything. So uh, it's it's always nice that uh, Gabe comes prepared and and uh, ready to deal with stuff.